I think we're live. Are we? It still says setting up. Oh, I see live. Excellent. Let's be live. Hi, Let's everybody. Be live. <laughs> <laughs> so I am Carolyn Byers. I'm the Education Director at Madison Audubon. And I'm Brenna Marsicek. I'm the Director of Communications and Outreach at Madison Audubon. And we're here today to talk to you about phonology journals. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been a while since we've done a Facebook Live via Zoom, so so we struggled a little. So we're air fiving. Yeah. Yes, yes, we are. <laughs> All right. So the this this class right now is in preparation for a class we're doing in a few days. So on Monday, September fourteenth, I'm going to be teaching a start your phonology journal class. So we're going to be learning how. How to draw plants, basically. We're gonna start with plants. Of course, you can put anything in your journal, but I'll be teaching a little bit about how to make observations of a plant like a scientist and an artist, how to um, draw the plant you're looking at, not the plant you think you see, because we all know what we think a flower looks like, but it's usually not what the flower actually looks like. Um, we'll talk about how to make things look 3D and how to have a focal point um, and how to build beautiful phonology pages in your sketchbook. So anyways, there are still, is it 10 spots left, Brenna? 10 spots left. 10 spots left as of 10.04 on Friday morning. <laughs> and I'm going to so, pop the link in right now. Awesome. So if, you, if, you, if that class sounds exciting to you, click the link, go sign up. It's going to be fun, even though it's virtual. <laughs> Um, all right, so this class is just to help anyone who is taking that other class get started with their sketchbook. So you don't need to have your sketchbook ready to take that um, starting your phonology journal class. You could just use a piece of paper if you want to and build your sketchbook later. But if you want to have your sketchbook ready, this is for you. So um, the first thing we should talk about is what is phonology? Uh, and that is basically the study of how things how natural things change throughout the year. So trees, they bud, they grow leaves, they leaves turn color, they fall off, maybe, unless you're a pine tree. And then that doesn't happen quite as much. <laughs> Birds, they build nests, they lay eggs, they raise young, they fledge their young. So there's phenology in everything. And I keep a phenology sketchbook um, so that it, it causes me to draw regularly, observe, the world around me, pause, take a break, and really just be present. Um, and of course, it helps me build my art skills and my observation skills, but it's really a nice meditation and break, especially this year. Brenna, why do you keep your journal? <laughs> For me, I, I also really like that slow down thing and create really interesting, fun art um, but I also really like the idea of being able to track how things change between years, like mm -hmm. when I picked my first tomato from the garden mm -hmm. versus when that's going to happen next year and when that happened the year before. So it's a really fun keeping track of all the firsts. Yeah, I love it. And I like, uh, at least for my, my perpetual journal, I go back year after year um, and like the bergamot in my garden was blooming at the same time as last mm. year and the year before that, even though bergamot in other people's gardens had already bloomed. Uh, huh. So that was kind of cool to track Interesting. that. Yeah. And this year they semest earlier. So I think we had some really heavy rains and it just like totally pummeled the, all the blossoms. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they ended up drying out a little bit sooner. Uh, yeah, so I agree. It's huh. really cool to track changes year to year. Yeah. Um, so there are a few different ways you can build your own phonology practice. Um, and Brenna and I do things a little bit differently too. So that'll be fun to compare that. <laughs> so the, the first thing you can do is just draw. So um, when I first started keeping sketchbooks, you know, in high school, um, I would just toss a date on the top of the paper and start drawing. And I would move my way through the sketchbook. There was really no rhyme or reason to it, no rules. Um, and it was lovely. And you can do that. You don't have to build rules around it. You can just draw. Um, so that's that's rule way number one. Just draw and enjoy it. Um, the Another way you can do it is uh, structure it monthly. Um, so you can just say, 
here is a page or a section of pages. And during this month, I'm going to draw things that I see on these pages. Um, and when you do that, you could just work your way through a sketchbook until the end. You could dedicate one sketchbook per each year. Um, or we'll talk about another version in a second where you can just keep drawing and drawing and drawing in the same sketchbook. Um, so Brenna, you have a really nice example of monthly drawings, right? Can you share? Yeah, so, so this came to be because I tried a different approach that Carolyn's gonna talk about in just a minute. I tried that first and then I thought, oh, I need more. I need more <laughs> drawing in my life. So then I got another sketchbook so that I could put more of more each month on the same page. So for example, this was my March page Ooh. from this year. So we've got some cranes flying overhead. Those were the first cranes that I saw. Mm -hmm. um, the first plant that came out of our yard was rhubarb. My orchids were blooming in the office right as our <laughs> office shut down. So the title on this one is Office Orchids All Dressed Up and No One to Show. <laughs> <laughs> and um, a scylla that was our, our first flowering plant. Um, then in April, I did something similar. So plants, mm -hmm. lots of plants, lots of birds. You can mm -hmm. kind of tell where <laughs> my interests fall. Um, May is also along those lines. Um, let's see if I can find May. I like how much writing you get to do on these pages too, Brennex. There's just more space. Yeah, you know, it is really nice to be able to capture. So it feels more like a journal and not just a sketchbook where you can write some context. Like my three-year-old was the one who first saw this feather on the ground and she was so proud of herself in that. <laughs> so May is a lot more of the flowering variety because that was really what was happening and it was an explosion of color right when I needed it just to help me out of the COVID doldrums and it was mm -hmm. it's a really nice practice that way. Mm -hmm. I love I love that sketchbook Brenna. It's yeah thank nice. you. <laughs> um, so the the last uh, option I want to share with you is something called a perpetual journal and an artist by the name of Lara Call Gastringer. And I'm so sorry, Lara, if I'm saying your name wrong, um, but she is the one who I believe came up with this idea. And if you if you Google a perpetual journal, she's she's the only one who comes up. Um, so it's a really awesome idea. And what that is, is a sketchbook where you have a page designated for each week of the year. And so you make one drawing each week a year, and it's okay if you skip them, and we can talk about that in a second. But ideally, you have one drawing per week, per year. And then at the end of the year, you start over again at the beginning, and you add one more drawing per page per year. So everything becomes very layered. And let me see if I can find a good page in my journal for you. Oh, this one is pretty They're all good. <laughs> so there's a lot going on in this page. Um, from 2017, this is really faint. I have some mulberries flowering. From 2018, I have multiflora rose from a Governor Dodge camping trip. Uh, 2019, I have a ebony jewel wing damselfly. Nice. <laughs> I had to cool. look it up. I didn't know what it was. <laughs> um, perched on those flowers. And then 2020, um, geranium flowers on its way to seed. So they just all sort of layer and twine together. Um, and I really like this because um, if, if I skip a week, it doesn't matter because I've got years and years to catch up and fill it up. And there are definitely some pages, for example, the beginning of the school year, this page here, <laughs> one lonely drawing from 2019, and I've been doing it since 2017. So it turns out that September and October are really hard months for me to draw in because I'm getting ready for school. Um, but all these other pages, they have tons and tons of lovely layers on them um, because I just get to keep revisiting them. And this year I decided to do birds perched on plants. Tiny birds mm. and plants. <laughs> what kind of bird is that, Carolyn? This one is the song sparrows, and nice. they were apparently singing everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, what else do I have? I had these were crows carrying nesting material. 
And I was with mm, Midvale cool. Elementary when we saw these and it was a really cold March day and it was really windy and we were out in the middle of their soccer field. We were trying to play a big running game um, and all the kids were just not having it. And so these crows flew over magically carrying sticks in their beak. And I got to be like, look, what are those? What are they doing? And all the kids were just like snapped out of their funk. And we looked at the crows, we played the game and it was great. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. Crows. crows for the win. Crows for the win. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is another really, really lovely option. Just layering all of your drawings year after year. Mm -hmm. um, and that way you don't have to buy a new sketchbook. <laughs> you can <laughs> feel at home in your sketchbook, which I like. Um, Carolyn, a question that I hear come up about this perpetual phonology journal is what do you do in the winter when not much is happening? I love the winter. Let me get my nature basket. Hold on. I'll be right back. <laughs> the nature basket comes out again. So Carolyn teaches this class uh, usually each spring about um, doing nature art. And since we're all trying new things through the year, we're trying this class online this fall too. So this will be a fun variety. So we can find some fall objects that we can use to, to use for our first sketches in our phonology journal. Definitely. So, okay, first I do love drawing spring and summer things. Living things are lovely, but Living things are tricky because they, you either have to leave them outside, right? And draw outside, or maybe you pick it and try to draw it inside, but then it wilts probably very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, you could also take a picture of it, but then you're not really drawing from life. So drawing flowers are fantastic, but tricky for someone who works slow like me. <laughs> so or even like, forget about birds drawing oh, yeah. birds live. <laughs> Come on, no way. <laughs> drawing birds live is, that's a whole nother. We have, we've got a class yeah. on that. We've got a class on that. <laughs> um, so this is my nature basket full of uh, things, things to draw in the fall or the winter. Um, I have some bean pods that are all twisty and curly. I've got a pine cone. Every single walk we go on, my toddler hands me one of these pine cones from the same tree and says, mama, you can draw this? And it's lovely, but I have so many pine cones. Send me a message. I've got some bark. I've got some twisty leaves. There are so, so many things to draw in winter, especially um, flower seed heads. They're so interesting and intricate with lots of different textures. Um, I've got to have another one in here. Yeah. And so there's, there's so much to draw and you can feel much better about picking it when it's dried and bring it home. Um, there are probably not seeds in these because it was very late in the year when I picked it, but if you want to like tap out the seeds before you take it, that's a better practice. You can return them back where you found them when you're done. That's an awesome practice. Um, there are tons of things to draw. In so it's, it becomes less about that first thing you see in the winter. It's not, it's not truly phonology, right? But it's like, nature drawing still in the well, winter but it's still what's happening then you know like those plants are doing this at this time of the year mm -hmm. um it might not be something new that's happening because they've been doing that since october yeah. <laughs> um, but it's it's still what what you're seeing outside at that time um mm -hmm. so my nature basket might be a little bit of a lie because that's not what's outside right now but when i first found it that was what was going that was on legit yeah mm -hmm. Oh, and I also want to just put in really quick, if anyone has any questions for Carolyn about setting up your sketchbook or choosing a sketchbook, we're going to be talking some more through, uh, through those topics. But if you have any questions, pop them in the comments box. Yeah, we want your questions. Um, but that's a good segue. Should we talk about sketchbooks? Let's do it. Okay, so some things to think about when you're choosing a sketchbook like this. Um, first thing is how long you're going to be using it. So if you're using um, if you're using your sketchbook just for one year, maybe you don't have to think so hard about what you're going to be buying or making to put all your drawings in. But if this is going to be a multi-year adventure, you definitely <laughs> want to put some thought into your sketchbook. <laughs> yeah. um, so the first thing I would think about is the type of paper you want in your sketchbook. Um, and that is going to be dictated by what you're going to put on the paper. 
So I like to work in ink and watercolor a lot. So I make sure my sketchbooks have watercolor paper. Um, and that's just because when you're working in watercolors, it's a lot of water on the paper, um, oddly enough. And <laughs> you need the right kind of paper to be able to handle that water. Otherwise it gets really crinkly and the paper doesn't hold up as well. Um, so I like watercolor paper, but I know that some people like to use colored pencil or only ink or pencil. Um, and so they make different types of paper for all of those things. And some types of paper can handle many of those things. So just think about that. Um, send us your questions if you want, if you have specific questions, um, otherwise, there's a lot of information online about what kind of paper is out there. Um, or if you want a multi-functioning paper, just like general use, what would you recommend? If, if someone doesn't know if they like watercolor over colored pencil yet. Yeah, I would say if you're, if you're thinking at all, watercolor might be in the mix, just go with watercolor paper. Because in my sketchbook, it's watercolor paper, but I use colored pencil, pencil, ink, watercolor, um, I think that's it, but it can handle lots of things. And usually sketchbook paper for watercolor is only like 90 pounds and that's how thick the paper is. Um, and it doesn't usually have a lot of tooth to it. That's like the topography of the paper. It can either be rough or smooth. Um, so it'll be pretty multifunctional. Um, so that's what I would recommend if you're not sure what you're gonna go with. Mm -hmm. Excellent question. <laughs> um, so the next thing you want to think about is the size of your sketchbook. Mine is this large, which fits very neatly into my backpack um, whenever I want to take it somewhere. Um, you might want to go larger because that would give you more space. Brenna, you've got a really big one. For your that mom. one doesn't often come in the field, though. So <laughs> okay. uh -huh. my phenology one is a lot smaller. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And is is great that way. Definitely good to think about what can fit well in a backpack. Mm -hmm. uh, I would also think about the orientation of it. So you've seen that mine is very landscape, very horizontal. I have regrets about this because <laughs> lots of plants that I draw are very, very vertical. <laughs> uh -huh. Um, so I run into trouble there and because I'm going to be using it year after year, I don't want to keep flipping the orientation of the sketchbook. You know, if I was just drawing in at one page at a time, I would totally flip the orientation. Um, but the next time when I finally run out of space on this one, I'm going to buy one that is portrait, not landscape. Um, probably, probably the exact same size, just a fold on this way, uh, because that'll just give me a little bit more versatility and how I can lay things out. Um, so that's, that's important. <laughs> Don't have regrets. <laughs> <laughs> and you probably will, but at least give something a try, think about what you want, and then you can always change it. Definitely. definitely. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I do love this sketchbook and I'm going to be so sad when it's time to move on. So I'm, I'm not uh, dissatisfied and I'm definitely still enjoying it. <laughs> Um, let's see, binding is really important um, because people have strong feelings about binding, not because there's a right or wrong answer, just because people have strong feelings. For example, I need to have a stitch bound sketchbook. I think they're stronger. I think they can handle how rough I am with my sketchbooks and how little care I put into tossing them into my backpack. Um, and I think spiral bound for me um, I'm just too rough on them. I'm no good at keeping a spiral bound sketchbook. Um, and I think my pages fall out quickly like that. Mm -hmm. Brenna though has different feelings. I do. I, I really like that I can do this mm -hmm. when I paint. <laughs> it just feels more contained and I can control the movement a little better. So I like being able to flip it on itself. Totally. So go with your heart. <laughs> <laughs> figure out what you like and roll with it. There's no wrong answer, but know that spiral bound versus stitch bound is kind of a big deal. Um, but along those lines, um, some tricks to help you manage your page is um, using clips and rubber bands. So um, this sketchbook comes with a fancy little rubber band on it. While you're drawing, you can clip it over the page like this so that if it's windy out, your page won't be blowing around. You can also get 
um, those alligator clips that you use like to hold hold your thesis together when you're taking it to be done. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so you can also use those in your sketchbook to keep um, both keep your pages flat if you're working in watercolor um, and it's like the, the paper doesn't crinkle as much um, or to, on windy days to help it stay down. Um, the final thing on my list for things to think about is the number of pages. Um, so if you're doing a journal where you're going to be, you have some structure to it, you really have to count the pages because if you want one page for each week of the year, you need at least 52 pages. <laughs> if you have fewer, you'll be disappointed. Um, and the other thing to think about is whether or not, um, so for mine, this is one week, this is the next week. You could do it so this is all one week, this is the next week. So when you're thinking about the number of pages, think about whether it's sides of a page or open faces. Um, and then while you're in the store or online, I suppose, you'll be counting and flipping. <laughs> Usually they're labeled, <laughs> um, but definitely think about the number of pages you have. Um, and if you're going through like, like Brenna's sketchbook where she does one month, is it per page or you have several pages per month? Uh, just one month per page. Oh, okay. If you wanted to do more than one month per page, you could also just, you know, count how many pages there are in your book and say, okay, I get four, I get four pages or fewer for each month. Um, and that would fill it up for a year. Um, but if you do one month per page, then you can keep going year after year, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> Big sketchbook. Yeah. The other thing that I want to say is that you can make your own sketchbook. Um, it is super fun. It's a lot of time, um, but I think it's really rewarding. And this was a sketchbook I made um, and it's got lots of different types of paper in it. So I have just some plain computer paper in there for sketching. Um, I have some computer paper that I printed. I don't know if you can see that. It's got a dot grid in it. Mm -hmm. um, yep. So you can, you can download a dot grid or I also did some like a, a square grid. Um, so it's just really finely printed. So I have a dot grid or a square grid if I'm working on something a little more scientific. Um, I also have watercolor paper stuck in there. Um, and I just did that randomly so that I have a selection of papers to work from. Um, and maybe you wanna do it less randomly so that you know for each month you have one watercolor paper, one sketchbook paper, one dot grid, so that you can plan your sketches accordingly. Um, and you can put pockets, pockets in the back. Pockets. Cool. You are such a pocket in the journal gal. I love what do you pocket use your pocket, pocket for? What don't I use my pocket for? <laughs> <laughs> I usually, um, I put stickers in my pockets for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I put color mixing charts, which I'll show you in a second. I put color wheels um, in my really big pockets. I put um, paint samples oh, yeah. um, so that I have paints at the ready. Um, one of my sketchbooks has a, a letter from my dad, <laughs> which I like tucked in there. Um, yeah, do you have pockets? What do you put in your pockets? No, I don't have any pockets. Actually, I do have a pocket on this one and it's empty. I have, I have, a lot of something to do with that pocket. I need. I'll send you a letter. You can put it. Okay, in. thank you. That'd be great. <laughs> Get the pocket started. Yeah. Okay. Um, <coughs> all right. So let's talk about how to set up your perpetual journal. I think we touched on this a little bit. Um, so if you if you are going to do a perpetual journal, one that you visit year after year, um, what I did um, was I, I first of all decided how many pages I would have per week which was one, because that was how many pages were in the sketchbook. <laughs> there was not enough for a, a full face per page. Um, the next thing I did uh, was decide how I wanted to label the weeks. Um, so if you go through and label them like February 1st through 7th, um, the next year, the weeks are gonna be shifted. So you're not gonna have the full week on that page, right? So you're gonna have to think today is July 2nd and you're gonna have to flip through the page to find July 2nd. And it might not be within the same week it was last time, which is fine for me, but maybe your brain wants it to be February, you'll just do one, two, three, four, and then March, one, two, three, four, five. Um, I think either way, there's gonna be some wiggle room and it's not gonna land perfectly each year. Mm -hmm. So you have to be okay with that. 
Do you have thoughts on that, Bruno? Um, yeah, I, I think I set mine up to be March 8th through 14th, March 15th through 21. And, yeah. and it will be a little bit weird next year, but like the, the date on the calendar, the March 15th is consistent each year. You know, like the phonology happens not based on the day of the week, but by yeah. the day of the month. So I feel like that is a more true, at least to me, a more true representation of phonology. Yeah, I agree. I like it. So my sketchbook, I have the month going down the side and I did happen to have letter stamps. So I wrote out the letters, which is it's sideways and backwards right now, right? <laughs> no, I, it's, it's legible. There you go. Okay. okay. And then I have the days of the week up in the corner. Uh, so when, and this, I only did it on one side for the month. So the days of the week are just up here. Um, so when I flip through, I look for the month first and then the date, and then I start to draw. Um, and that works for me pretty well. Um, I think that's all we need to talk about as far as setting it up initially, right? Yeah. I think so. You know, in our, in our class in February, I think there were some people who set theirs up as first week of March and didn't put mm -hmm. dates in there so that it could be a little more flexible for if you wanted it to be a Sunday through Saturday thing. Yeah. It would be a little more like the first part, you know, it, it wasn't so specific. So yeah. An option. Mm -hmm. I like it. Sorry. I was just thinking about those weeks where it's like, half of one month and half of the other and how does that uh -huh. and my brain just spiraled it's hard <laughs> <laughs> the way i have it i think is easier for my brain but yeah there's so many ways to do it um okay should we talk about let's talk about um building sketches on your paper um and then supplies because supplies are always fun um so the first year it's pretty easy right or you just draw whatever you want on the paper. Um, but I do like to think about where, how I'm leaving space for things in subsequent years. Um, so for example, on this page, there's two drawings here, but I've got them sort of over to the side so that I have room if I want to do something larger, uh, I can still do that. And I clustered these two drawings. Um, on other pages, this one, uh, I have one drawing off to the side and two that are a little bit layered. So I'm restricting myself to this area in the future. Um, so you sort of, as you go, you will definitely get better at knowing how to place plants near each other to complement each other. And so that plants don't get lost um, when they're near each other. Uh, so here's another example. I have some round-headed bush clover and some um, purple coneflower here. And when I first drew them, which did I do first? So the round-headed bush clover was 2018 and this was 2019. And when I first drew this one, I hadn't painted it in. Um, but then when I drew this behind it, it was really hard to differentiate between the two. So then I added some color to this one a year later. And it was very lucky that I had taken a photo of this because I could just scroll back through my photos and find it. Um, but that was a way to separate these two plants and make them make it easier to see them visually on the page. Um, there's some other things you could do. Actually, you should just go follow Lara Call Gastringer because she has amazing sketchbooks and she's been doing a lot of live stuff on Instagram lately showing you how to uh, how to build these sketchbook pages. And one of the things she really likes to do is add some color behind a sketch to help make it pop. Um, That's and cool. I have discovered I like doing it too. <laughs> <laughs> so that's something I can recommend. Um, there's also, you could also make boxes around things. Um, and I did that for this one because Splatter Campion is a really light pale flower and I thought giving some contrast behind it would really help make it pop. Um, 
And so then you can also sort of overlap the boxes with other, other flowers, other drawings, mm -hmm. and that gives it a little bit more interest. Mm -hmm. um, Brenda, do you have anything to add about layering drawings? This is my first year of doing it. So I don't have any advice about layering, but I also did want to suggest you go back to your damselfly because it's sitting on top of a previous drawing, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm looking up Laura Call's Instagram page now, so I can yeah, show so this one's got a lot of stuff in and around each other. So the the geranium is a bit behind the um, what is that multiflora rose, and yeah, my dragonfly was perched on top of it. Mm -hmm. That's a fun That's way cool. to do, do insects. Mm -hmm. I had another one here with a butterfly. I had some bergamot from 2018 and my monarch from 2020 got added on here and I only oh, had to cool. draw over it a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. So how are you feeling about layering in the coming year? Are you ready? I'm excited. I'm excited to try it. I, I like the examples that you have. I also feel like maybe I, I made some mistakes in laying out some of the, the, the drawings the first year. So it'll be interesting. I'm excited. It's cool. And the nice thing is like, the, the more you add to these, the more interesting they get. So, you know, mm -hmm. as your skill changes or your style changes, um, it's, I think it's nice to see the progression on the page, uh, rather than frustrating having it not all be the same. Uh, yeah, I like it. It's cool. To yeah. see the growth. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have any questions, Brenna? No, we do not right now. <laughs> Okay. I well, just, yep. Go ahead. That's fine. If you're watching this and it's not live, you can still type questions in and we will get back to you as soon as we see them. Um, all right. So let's talk quickly about supplies, I think, because that's really fun. I like it. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So when I go out, so first I will admit that sometimes I go out and draw in the field and sometimes I take pictures or I will pick something, usually something dead and bring it in and draw it. So when I say supplies for the field, I often mean my couch in the evening after my kids asleep. <laughs> <That's what laughs> I draw. Same. Um, so I have, I have this bag, which actually zips onto my backpacking pack conveniently. Um, and I have uh, commandeered it as my art bag. Um, and in it, I have my sketchbook fits in there, which is pretty cool. I have several little bags for holding art supplies. Um, and I have a few different watercolor palettes because that's a lot of what I work with. Um, so I've got one in a metal tin. It's all dried paint pans because they're not messy and easy to use in the field. Um, this is one that I built. Uh oh, my paint is falling out. Um, this was just a $8 uh, palette that I got at an art store. And then you can buy tubes of watercolor paint and squeeze it in there and let it dry and sometimes they fall out, but usually not. <laughs> so that is really, uh, that's, that's how I carry paint in the field. Um, I also learned a new trick recently. You can take a tube sock and cut off the ankle part, and then you can put it on your wrist and not have to hold paper towels. Oh, and it's amazing. Painful, right? I love it, so cool. Um, so that's my new paper towel trick. Um, I have in these bags, I have pencils, erasers. Um, I carry a ruler mostly to use as a straight edge, but sometimes I measure the science is cool. Um, I have a the compass, I think. Uh, and I use that for making circles in my sketchbook. Um, if I want to, you know, say draw, usually I draw things um, life size in my sketchbook. So if I'm drawing something that's not life size, I might put it in a circle or in a box to denote that. Um, it's also really nice for measuring things. So if I want to measure the, get the proportions right on this pine cone, I can measure the width like this mm. and then say that it is about two widths long. Um, so that way I'm making sure that things are proportional and so that they look realistic. Um, but the nice thing about pine cones is they're not all the same. So there can be a little bit of difference in your drawing and it'll still look good. Um, 
what else do I carry in here? I do have a pencil sharpener. I've got a little tin here where I have two different types of erasers. Um, and I just like keeping them in a container so they stay clean because I hate when my eraser is covered in graphite. It makes me so grumpy. Um, <laughs> speaking of, here's another cool thing I found. These little plastic lids for your pencils. I forget where I found them, but they were a game changer for me. And I hate buying plastic. It makes, that makes me grumpy too, but um, I have not lost one yet. So that's good. Ah, <laughs> and they cool. keep my pencil tips nice and sharp and my case clean. What else? I've got these little clips for my paper to hold them down, keep them from blowing mm -hmm. around. This was not the one I used to hold my thesis. <laughs> <laughs> And then I have some travel paintbrushes. Um, this one is really cool. It was super cheap, like seven bucks. Um, and you can unscrew this and fill it with water so that, again, when you're painting outside, you don't have to dip into a water container. You can just fill it and paint. Um, it takes a little getting used to, but it's still really nice. And I love that these bristles are synthetic so that you can be really rough with them. and uh, I mean, I totally take care of my supplies, definitely. Um, <laughs> you can be really rough with them and it maintains its point. It's very forgiving and uh, it's just a great brush. I like it. I have much, much fancier brushes, but I use this one way more. Um, speaking of fancier brushes, I have this one too. Um, and this is another type of travel brush. Uh, you do need a, something to dip in, but it's um, also a really cool brush and I, I do use it often. Um, a note about water in the field. Um, I recommend if you are in a sensitive spot that you pack an extra container to put your dirty water in. Um, but I've also done some research and at least in Madison, the sewerage treatment plant would not be able to extract the paint from the water before it's returned. Um, so it would get diluted anyways. So you can make your decision there about what you do, um, but it is good to know how your wastewater is cleaned and how much can be removed from your wastewater. Um, and something to think about when you choose your paints. Maybe you don't want to use artist grade paints because they do contain chemicals. Um, and maybe you want to use the student grade paints because they're just kinder and softer and much cheaper. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Brenna, do, is there any what kind of art supplies do you have that you love that you bring out? Um, I So this is my case. I also, I think it's actually supposed to be a makeup bag, but you know, I got it off the clearance section, so I'll use it for whatever. Um, so my eraser is in a camera roll container, which works well. It keeps it soft when it's inside and also free of pet hair and other things. <laughs> Uh -huh. um, this is the watercolor case that actually Carolyn gave me, and it's kind of a mess right now, but I like to reuse the different paints that I mix on there, so um, I don't often clean it off. My pencils, colored pencils, I put in a case. I forget where these cases came from, but maybe I bought paint brushes in them or something, and it does a good job of keeping the rest of my bag a little more tidy and not filled with color. Uh -huh. um, so then I have a bunch of brushes in there that, you know, don't get treated very well, but <laughs> a micron pen yeah, and a white gel pen, which is really fun. And nice. then I always bring a paper towel. I'll use that tube sock idea though. That's awesome. And I have a designated water cup. It has a lid that I can put on it, but this is the only water cup I use when I paint for the reason that you were talking about, just not wanting all those chemicals mixed in with other things in my kitchen. So, <laughs> yep, uh -huh. that's my bag. Nice. I so like we it. do have a question, Carolyn. Oh, awesome. Sally said, I am not artistically talented in drawing and am intimidated in starting. How do I overcome that? Well, I think that you are not alone at all. And I still feel that way sometimes too when I'm facing a blank page. Um, so I think the perpetual journal is a really good way to do that because it's something you don't have to show anyone. You're not gonna 
you know, it's a journal. You're not going to put it on your wall. You're not going to try to frame it. You're not even going to stick it on your fridge. Um, so it's just, it's just something for you. Um, it will also help you see how your skills are growing. But the really important thing about this is that it's not really about making art. It's about observing the world. It's about taking a moment to relax and experience nature. It's about recording memories. Uh, so even though I don't write very much in my sketchbook, let's find one. Um, this one here just says balsam fir up north with friends. But I remember the exact hike I was on, who I was with, what like what the tree looked like that I took this off of how I had to hold it and my kid for half of the walk and try not to crush it and like, <laughs> like I have so many memories tied up in this drawing um and it doesn't I, I mean I am pleased with how this one turned out but even if it didn't turn out well I would still have all those memories with it um mm -hmm. so I think if you start out with the intent to record memories make observations become a better observer, naturalist, artist, then you're going to win. There's no failing. Uh, and then as you draw more and more, then your skills will grow and you can take classes with us and we'll help you grow faster, but it's, <laughs> um, and, or not. I mean, that's not, you don't have to do that. You can just draw, um, but it's just really lovely and it's a great way to appreciate nature. Yeah. I, I would say too, I, prior to last year, was in the camp of I draw stick figures. And then I started drawing with Carolyn and I, I have learned so much from Carolyn and then just taking the time to do it myself and just feel like, well, that didn't turn out great, but it was really fun to just sit down and do that for a little bit, have a little me time and not worry about what the outcome was. So I, you get better and better with each one that you do. And, and even if one of them, doesn't show that you've gotten better, it's still a good, good time spent. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it's, it's worth it, even if it's a little intimidating to start, it's definitely worth it. Definitely. Ooh, Sally, I hope you start drawing. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I, um, I want to share one more thing. And then maybe Brenna, you can, if you have anything else you want to share, jump on in. Um, but I really love making color mixing charts. Um, and if, I mean, it's mostly just because I work in watercolor. I suppose you could do it with colored pencil too, if you wanted to. Um, but for me, it's really helpful both to get to know the palette that I'm working with, you know? So over here I have all of the, um, sorry, I should finish my sentence. It's, <laughs> it's both to get to know your palette and also to make mixing colors quicker when you're out in the field because um, while I love mixing color, I love getting the right color on my paper more. <laughs> um, so making that go faster is helpful to me. So for this mixing chart, I have all of the colors on my palette here. I have a very concentrated form on this side, and then it blends to have mostly water on this side. So you can see the full range of color that you can get just with that uh, dipping right out of the palette. Um, then over here, I have a matrix where it's all of these colors mixed with all of these colors. Um, so for example, this color here is uh, this color mixed with this color up here. Um, so the, the, the plain colors without mixing are also along this gradient. Um, so in this way, I can find like, this is the closest color to what I wanna make. I know the two colors that I need to get there and then I can adjust from there. So it's a lot quicker when I'm mixing. Smart. Yeah, I did not come up with it. That was another one when I saw it online. It was like, awesome, I'm going to do it. <laughs> and I'm going to make all of them. <laughs> um, and the other thing, like, so you can, you can also get a color wheel to help you mix. Um, I don't use this often, but it's fun to have and sometimes useful to me. Um, and I mentioned this really briefly. Um, there are watercolor companies that make sample sheets for people who perhaps want to spend thousands of dollars on watercolors um or you can just spend 25 bucks and get all 260 colors that they make but you have just a tiny little sample of each one but if you're only doing a tiny little drawing in a sketchbook once a week this is really all you need uh at least of most colors some colors will need more of that but um you can find out what colors you really want from something like this. 
Um, and what do you call that, Carolyn? I'll put that in the comments. A, I think it's called like a, a, a color sample sheet or a dot sheet. Like if you if you walk into an art store and say, I'm looking for a dot sheet of Daniel Smith or of Windsor Newton, they'll know what you're talking about. Um, but it's the, the samples of paints. Mm -hmm. um, so those are really, really fun to use. Um, what else? Anything else we want to talk about? I, think I don't think so, one. except for that, if you're interested in doing some of this artwork in the field, we have a few options for you in terms of our sanctuaries. Fable yeah. Grove Sanctuary is near Lake Mills and it's about 800 acres that's free and open to the public. Mm -hmm. Goose Pond Sanctuary is north of DeForest, um, also about 700 acres and Otsego Marsh is our newest one. I'll drop the links for all of those into the comments as well, but they're all free. They're all open to the public any day of the week and great places to escape and find some good fodder for your artwork. All filled with plants and birds and sunsets. And Other sunsets. critters. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. And I think nature journaling, no matter how you do it, is a really great way to build a routine around your art because Sometimes it's just hard to find time. And so if you if you set a goal and try to stick with it, you don't have to, of course, but you know, be flexible with yourself. Uh, but having a routine really helps you draw more. And if you draw more, you'll get better at it. Uh, mm -hmm. art, everybody thinks that art is something you're born with and it's absolutely not. You can learn it for sure and get better at it. Um, so do some drawing and enjoy it um, if you want to. Like we said, there's still 10 slots left in our class starting your phonology journal. Um, and that's Monday, September 14th from 7 to 9 p.m. It is virtual. Uh, we often teach these classes in person and we're so, we're itching to get out there and teach in person again. So know that that'll be happening as soon as we're able to. Um, and I think that's it, right, Brenna? Right, that's so it. Our, Programs like this are free. Some of them, like our naturalist classes, we do have a small fee for, but most of them are free, They're open to anyone with an internet connection. So if you have felt like you've learned something or you appreciate that we have free programming for people, um, we're gonna drop a link in the comments. You can donate and support us and keep our programming free for everyone. Um, but if that's not you right now, that's okay because it'll still be here free for you because nature should be for everyone. Um, so go outside, go do some art, grab a pencil and some computer paper and just go draw. You don't need supplies, go do it. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Carolyn. Thanks everyone. Yeah, thanks Brenna. Bye everyone.